Okay, so I've been told to start, so I think I want to start, turn this off. Bon, bonjour, this is um, Colin Laguerre from France, from Nantes Université, and um, I'm going to talk about a, a new object on the map. The new object is called the Unitwin Network on Open Education. And even if I'm the only person presenting, actually there's a whole bunch of people, and you'll see their names and even their pictures appear in a little moment. So, um, Unitwin Network of Open Education and UNESCO, this means that it is an object that is created under the auspices of the UNESCO. So what are these Unitwin uh, networks? Well, the Unitwin networks are actually the big brother of the Unitwin um, um, uh, chairs. So the UNESCO has got things called UNESCO chairs. There's a couple of uh, UNESCO chairs in the conference in this moment working on open education. And when you put a number of UNESCO chairs together, you obtain a UNITWIN network. So the program of UNITWIN has been successful for the past, I think, 40 years now. And there's about 800 chairs in the world, and there's about 100 networks. And uh, the thing you want to know is that perhaps what you don't want to know is that uh, these networks are not funded. So they actually got the prestige of UNESCO without getting the, the money that could be associated. But anyhow, the idea is that in 2022, during last year's Open Education Global, a number of us were approached by UNESCO saying, we would like you to actually build one of these networks. So why would UNESCO want that? Well, we know that in 2019, UNESCO um, got us all, well, got the different countries to uh, adopt the recommendation. And even if the recommendation is a successful object, as uh, Cable was explaining today, eh, there's still work to be done over the, the, the world to actually um, get everybody to realize it. So uh, the idea was to um, put a number of uh, UNESCO chairs, there were about 10, 10 of us there, and say, okay, can you build um, this network? So why? Well, to be able to support the UNESCO initiatives related with open education um, resources and open education, uh, to also think about the open education research agenda. There's been a bit about this in the conference. We've heard it in the GoGN talks, but we've heard it also in separate talks where people say, you know, this is perhaps the moment where we want to move a little bit faster with the research agenda. So well, this is one of the things we want to do. We also want to raise funds. We also heard a bit about this in the... Um, in Cable's talk this morning, and uh, we need to support the development of open education everywhere. So one of the things hidden behind this is that in certain cases, UNESCO chairs come in handy in a country to help develop um, open education. And we are thinking through this network to convince people in different countries to also go for UNESCO chairs and therefore have an even larger network. So... Um, why? So the, the, the title is perhaps a little bit um, exaggerated. Why does the world need this? The world doesn't need this, of course. But why would you want another object when you've already got a number of objects in the, uh, in the um, setting of um, uh, open education? So the reasons are, well, one of the ones I've just said earlier, we think that we have to work now on research because of the question of maturity. So at one point you're actually doing things, and the other moment you need your researchers, whether they're researchers in the social sciences or in the sciences, or in this moment artificial intelligence, to work in the field. So we want to push that agenda. We also believe that cooperation is, in many cases, at least around research, is, is monolingual, and we want to try and promote multilingualism. This is going to be one of the key uh, questions of this network. North-South is an issue for UNESCO, but for a lot of people in, um, at this conference, so we'll continue with that. And um, yes, I mean, open educational resources was what was on the table. That was what UNESCO adopted in 2019 for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was that actually you, you, know, you could have, a, in a solid way, most of the countries in the world agreeing on saying, yeah, we're, we're prepared to do this. Whereas if you talked about the issues of open education with a lot of, I wouldn't say controversial questions there, but at least questions that would interrogate a lot of things in different systems, the world wasn't quite ready for a recommendation on open education at that point. So we think it's where we should be going now. And there is a specific link we want to make between open education and social justice. Okay, so this is the network, this is the map. I was hoping, I was trying to ask to do the map the other way around and put South America at the top, but this is the best we got. So anyhow, you can see in brown some countries. I'm just trying to show that it's global because we do have uh, New Zealand down at the bottom there somewhere. And we've got, well, countries in South America, North America, in Africa, 
and in Europe. And if you count uh, Lebanon, Lebanon saves us and allows us to say that we're present in Asia. It doesn't mean we're that good all over the planet, but it is global in, the, in, in that sense. So um, I'm going to do a quick presentation, I mean, just so you see who these guys are and also understand what UNESCO chairs actually do. So he, here are pictures of these people. So Rory, who's around, who could be around in the room, he's not in the room, but we heard him speak here and he's um, clearly the Canadian um, chair on uh, open education. And we've heard him uh, talk about um, the questions relating to AI, but relating also to the blockchain and to micro-credentials. That was his talk yesterday. Uh, I've just seen uh, Marisol in the room over there. So uh, it comes from Mexico, where they've got a hugely active um, um, chair on a number of topics, both on social sciences side, but also on technology-linked um, uh, questions. Uh, Brazil is not present here, at least uh, Tel Amiel isn't present, but there's also a very strong chair which has been doing a lot of things for the UNESCO for a very long time. I think it's the oldest one of the UNESCO chairs in open education, perhaps even older than, um, uh, than, than, than uh, Rory's, which, you know, which is to show. Uh, the Universidad de la República is represented. I mean, the ex-chair is here, but the, uh, the, there are people representing the chair here. So this is interesting. Because, you know, we've got a bit of South America, and again, we can find technology involved in that chair. L'Université de Rabat, Morocco. So this is not a UNESCO chair. This is another organization, which is called ISESCO, which is a more uh, closer to the, an, an Islamic uh, um, organization. And uh, they've just uh, started a new chair on open education, and they're tremendously active in, in that part of the world, even if you'll see less of them in the English-speaking conferences, perhaps. So Unir in Spain, Daniel Burgos is named here, a lot of people have seen here, and he's also in this network. Not Université, that's me when uh, I didn't forget to cut my hair. This is Université born, born in, in Germany, uh, so the, uh, our friends from Germany are there, Christian Schracker, and they're also active very much in the computing um, areas. Uh, Stefan Institute, Slovenia, Michel Jarmol, he used to come very often to this conference. So again, there are people who are involved in this com community, have been involved for a while. And uh, Micha is, um, is, well, he's, he's also known for his work on trying to apply artificial intelligence in the, in the context of this. He was in charge of the Video Lectures platform, which was one of the most successful platforms for videos um, at some point, for open videos. IRKAI is a new player in the case of artificial intelligence and UNESCO, and so they are part of the network. Université de Sousse Tunisia, so Lilian, she was at Open Education Global last year, and she's also tremendously um, um, interested and uh, active in all our questions. Notre Dame in Lebanon, and this is Fauzi Baroud, who, has, uh, who runs all sorts of things in, um, in, in that part of the world. We've got two universities from Cape Town. The first one is represented by Glenda Cox. I think there was a talk by Glenda Cox, but she wasn't giving the talk in one of the rooms just half an hour ago, so she's also clearly involved in our community. And another um, um, chair in uh, South Africa, this time it's in the UNISA, and Mimpine, she's very interesting for us because when we're thinking about open education from the north point of view, we are, you know, she's an eye opener. She's actually really much more interested in how open education gets out of universities, gets out of schools, and plays a role in the city or plays roles in the society and with communities. So I think that's another direction in which we'll be wanting to go, thanks to a sort of a broader, um, more global approach. And New Zealand appears twice once because the Open Education uh, Resource uh, Foundation is part of the, um, the, of the network. And the second one, because the actual university in New Zealand, Tepekunga, is also part of it with uh, Wayne McIntosh um, there. So I've shown you 16. So why 16? Well, actually, UNESCO said we were allowed up to 15. So we pushed it a little bit and went to 16. OK, what are the goals here? So the goals is open education in the sense that open educational resources plus open educational practices plus uh, free and open so uh, source software. It's, it's a combination of a bit of all these three objects that we're hoping to, to, to move. And we're obviously, and this should remind you of the talk, the keynote we had this morning, thinking how can open education allow for a better sharing of knowledge? That's the sort of questions, overarching questions we're interested in. 
And the second overarching question is how necessary is open eye education for, to achieve some form of social justice? Okay, so we had defined, when we actually had to present this to UNESCO, we defined the 10 objectives. I'll go through them quickly. I mean, we're still at an objective um, you know, phase only sort of saying this is what we want to do. So community building, which it's logical. I mean, it's part of what we should try to do. But not just in the 15 universities or the 16 organizations, as I showed before. We have to go in a broader sense and outside our own countries. In a way, um, UNESCO chairs play a strong role in the countries in which they are. Uh, they, you know, in many places, UNESCO is an important, or at least it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's something that matters. So we're able to use that to, to, to move the agenda in our, in our own countries. But the question is, can we sort of use this UNESCO brand, this UNESCO la label, to move it in the countries that don't have UNESCO chairs? So this is what we're going to try and do with, of course, forces on the ground. It doesn't mean that we, the UNESCO chairs, have to go into the, the other countries. But people here are thinking, you know, we could have some help. We need some help. I mean, of course, if you're asking for money help, we won't be able to help. But if we want UNESCO help, we can come in and sort of think, well, you know, perhaps, you know, organizers, just invite us to come. We can pay for the trip, but then we might be able to force a meeting with somebody to, to, to get the, the agenda rolling, that sort of thing. So we have to, of course, uh, co cooperate closely with UNESCO and uh, with um, um, all sorts of other people there. So, uh, research. What are the sort of uh, things we need to do in research? Well, we want, to, uh, we want to actually do research and circulate research. So we have the feeling that it's not that easy to find research material. Uh, a lot of the mat research material in our field is, strangely enough, inside some books that are, belong to editors, and you have to actually pay to access them. It's, I don't know why we're in this strategy of publishing in, you know, in collections with chapters that then you have to pay a very, very strong price to read research on open education. So in Cable's talk this morning, I think we are quite guilty of not doing it the right way ourselves. So we want to engage in shared research programs and uh, have some mentoring activities. So we do have in our teams people who can help with this. We hope to do that. And uh, yeah, there's a link to be done. And again, we saw about things about this this morning between open science and open education. So I'm not going to talk about which are exactly the themes of research we're interested in. But if you look at the words here, the first theme is saying, what is, what is um, education of tomorrow? How is the open education agenda going to be moving towards the education of tomorrow? And this, of course, brings us into the role of artificial intelligence, but perhaps other technologies like blockchain also. You know, how, how do these things influence the, uh, the futures of education? So that's uh, one of the themes. The capacity building to, as an object of research, sort of how does open education change the relationships between the people, between the teachers, between the teachers and the, and the students, and try and sort of examine what is happening there? And the third question is around the social justice. Is, can, uh, in what sense does open education, we all say you know, it's very important to keep the prices low and this is allowing people to actually access education. Um, we, we need more evidence about this and it's probably different in between the different countries. And so we want to see why does it work, when it works, and what conditions, what are the conditions that are necessary for this to work. So there's, of course, a focus on education, where we think that there's a number of courses, but we also need courses on open education itself. So we've heard about some of these in the rooms here, but if you're in a university and you want to train your teachers, or if you want to train your uh, librarians, or your, your, your educator, whoever you want to train, it's not that easy to get hold of material that you can use. We've, we've been doing some, we have to actually make this shareable in a way we can say, look, this is, uh, we can certify, we know that this works, you, you should be able to try it. Okay, and then we want to do some education, some curricula and academic research to, well, to understand what is working and what is not. So then there's two more. So let's say research and education are the two normal things you would expect in a network on open education to work about. There's two other ones. So one of them is software, where we think that there is software out there that should be used in order to um, better share what we're doing, because software and computers and um, digitalization obviously matters a lot. So we want to be careful about this. So there are two 
questions there that we uh, have um, at least identified to try and work on this. And we're hoping also to be able to offer, uh, propose entry points for people to come and download suites of material, of uh, free and open software that they can use here. Um, and I think I had another one before that, so I don't know where it's gone to. Okay, never mind. Right, so conclusions and what happens next at this point, and then we'll have time to perhaps answer some questions. So conclusions and what happens next. So first is saying that uh, I'm presenting something that I had to also authorization to UNESCO. I'm allowed to talk about this, but we don't have a single paper saying that we've got the network. So, so the, the answer is they said, yes, please go ahead. And we're not very good at administration, and it takes time. And it's going to take also a lot of time to actually sign things. So you have to understand that in comparison to other more open networks, this one is one which is very heavily constrained by signatures and things of that sort. It's a bit of the, let's say, it's, it's, it's the downside of, of such an object. Um, the second one is saying that the network has a sets. Um, but there are already, and we have to acknowledge this, a lot of our associations and groups out there that are already working in open education. So, uh, you know, the first thing we're trying to do is reassure everybody, saying we're not coming here as a predator to try and sort of uh, pick anybody's uh, place. We just think that the assets we have as a small group of UNESCO chairs and trying to use the UNESCO labels to favor the, the, this with different techniques and with different ideas could be of help. Right, but we're obviously uh, open for discussion with absolutely every stakeholder there are, and this is what we've been doing these days, or, well, yesterday at least in networking, and we'll continue uh, doing here, uh, do, doing today and tomorrow. Talk to people and say, you know, if your group is interested in collaborating, we're still going to have to find, you know, our, our speed here, but we are open for, for discussions. Um, the third point is an important one. It's perhaps to remind you that open education is very important for UNESCO. Um, in September, there was the Digital Learning Week in, in Paris, and it was four days of, of conference, which is one of the big conferences on the question of digital education, with a lot of key people, a lot of ministers, a lot of um, education specialists. And out of those four days, two days were on the effects of artificial intelligence, and two days were on the effects of open platforms. So how important open platforms were for um, the futures of education. The problem with UNESCO is that they don't necessarily always op use the, uh, no, the word open. They might use shared platforms or common platforms or other terms. So even terms for which they have fought so hard to actually bring into the agenda the correct words, then for some reason they may not always use. But it is important, really important for UNESCO, which means that it's good to have them in, let's say, in the common cause or in the, the, the common battles we're all, we're coming out with. Um, and yes, as, as we're saying, in certain countries, UNESCO doesn't really matter because there's a lot of other organizations, a lot of other groups. But I like reminding people that in, in some countries uh, where, you know, where education is complicated to organize and the Ministry of Education is perhaps spending most of its time just trying to make sure there's one teacher in front of each pupil, in those cases, well, UNESCO plays a bit a role of the Ministry of Education that we have in our rich countries. Right, a place where you're thinking about the futures, you start considering what your policies are going to be. So all that is going to be done at UNESCO level. So that's why it also matters very much to, to keep UNESCO into these discussions. Point four is a joke. It's not a joke, it's important. But we were obviously open for funding opportunities if people say, well, why don't you, I mean, we'll take this into account. So point five, well, this is the moment where I just say, we're starting now, we're going to start doing actions, try and get into, um, into activities going. And the real thing is next year, you know, you'll be able to say, have you done anything in the first year? So I hope we will have said something, yes, not just we managed to sign the contracts. I mean, that would be disappointing if that was the only thing we've done. So we're hoping to have achieved things that we'll see you in one year's time to tell you what we've done. And point six is that is, now, later on in the evening, tomorrow, at any moment, we're open to discuss with absolutely everybody. We still have to invent a way to involve other people because it looks like a very small closed group. It is, per se, the way UNESCO asks us to set it, but we know that there are other people who would like to discuss, to do similar things, and we'll just have to be very inventive there to be able to actually do this. Thank you.
I believe there's time for questions. Oh yeah. Is is that your question, or is that or, or is that? Oh yeah. We, we have started, we've started. There are bigger organizations. Big. The thing is, when uh, it was one of the questions Cable got this morning, where people were saying, you know, going for funding when you're little is more difficult than going for funding when you're big. So we hope that's correct. So we are a bit bigger, and we're hoping we'll be able to get some funding from this. But we've started. I mean, even if it's not signed, the first thing we worked on this summer was already starting writing our first grant applications. Hi, Colin. I have a question here. I know it's hard to see you up there. Um, so uh, my question is, is UNESCO, would they be willing to consider adding chairs? So I feel like there are many, many nations with many, many great academics and scholars that are not represented in this group. Um, so would they be willing to add some UNESCO chairs? So I obviously can't speak for UNESCO. I have spoken with UNESCO, and I can interpret what I've understood. So the way you add new chairs is every country has got a national um, UNESCO organization, and they have to, are supposed to filter the applications, and each country is only allowed to come with two. So each country will come with two um, proposals, including the renewals. So it's, it's, it's hard work to actually get through. But the message for, for UNESCO is that open education is so important that if one country arrives with three and the third one is one for open education, then it will actually get past the two um, uh, barrier. So that's the first thing. And so then the second thing is one of the things we can do as an organization, we've all gone through the rota of actually depositing a chair application or whatever. So we can help people um, f go through the... Uh, the, the, it's not just the paperwork, but actually understanding how it works. So sometimes people get very dis, uh, disappointed when they find out that there's no money. So they're thinking, you know, how do you want me to actually write an application for something so complicated without saying, and I want so much money? It's worse. UNESCO, for your application to be accepted, you have to come and say, oh, by the way, we have got money. So you have to already have a project running with things happening for that to, to work. But it is, it is possible. I mean, if you're showing that there's energy, if you're showing that things are happening, UNESCO tends to, 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 to show um, a lot of interest in, 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 in letting you through. Wow. Um, Colin, can you say a few words about the extent to which the network will work together, uh, as opposed to like each of you autonomously doing your thing? And is there some way for those of us that are interested in the work that you're doing to follow what's being done and see what each of you are doing? Yeah, and that's, so that's, that's a good question. We, we haven't quite got that yet. I mean, we, we're working with the OER Foundation to find out if we're actually going to use their platforms and we don't have to invent a new platform to actually keep people informed. Uh, I should say Nantes University has been generous enough to actually appoint somebody you know called Solène right, to actually play the role for the logistics and to help run this thing and not let somebody hopeless like me do it, right? So, so this is, uh, all this is going to be we're working in the right uh, way. And so for people to find out, yes, we'll be on social, I suppose, on social media and, and, and make sure we, 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 we tell people. The interesting thing is when we're going to actually want people to collaborate with us and we're going to put things on the table to be able to collaborate. And so then how do we work as a group of 16? Is it going to be, you know, make sure that things are happening on each continent? That's going to be very important. But we also want to make sure that different languages are, are taken into account. I think it's, it's clearly something that we have to work on. And if possibly that the different languages are taken into account, but in the same network, not in different networks. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we stop there then. Thank you. We've got a network.